To my left is Mitsuko Ikeda. Our, our presentation, of course, is Oral Health Care for the Underserved, What Resources Are Available. Mitsuko Ikeda joined the NNOHA staff as project coordinator in June of 2009, and since, since September 2011 has served as its project director. In her current capacity, she plans, directs, and coordinates activities of designated projects under HRSA, National Cooperative Agreement, and other agreements to ensure that their goals or objectives are accomplished within prescribed time frame and funding parameters. She graduated from the University of Denver in 2008 with Master's in International Human Rights and a Certificate in Global Health Affairs. So welcome, Mitsuko. Appreciate your being here. Our other panelist, Dan Watt. <clears throat> Dan Watt, DDS, has been dental director for Idaho's largest community health center, Terry Riley Health Services, for over six years. Prior to this, he retired from the Navy with the rank of captain, was senior partner of a group practice in Virginia, and co-founded the International Oral Health Foundation. He's a member of NNOHA's Practice Management Committee and a presenter on leadership. He has long been an advocate for utilizing bacterial analysis and anti-infective therapy in managing oral diseases. <clears throat> me. Recently, he presented on integration of oral health into the patient-centered health home and helped organize a regional meeting in Boise, utilizing nationally known presenters on the topic. So welcome to you both. And Right into it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And of course, I'm going to interrupt you, but come on up to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody, you've gotten used to it by now, and you're probably used to it and tired of seeing me. I'm Paul Riley, uh, director of IT here. And before we start, we have to justify to the fine folks at Tarsa why we charge you so much money. So, everybody, right in front of you is a little white box. If you pick that up for a minute, we're going to do a couple quick surveys, and then we'll be moving right on with the presentation. Right now, talking about this presentation, how would you rate your knowledge of the oral health needs among aging and public housing population? One being excellent, four being poor, and just pick up the remote in front of you, pick one, two, three, four, whatever you think your current standard is, and 15 responses, and... 47% say pretty good, so let's go on to the next one. How would you rate your knowledge of the non-clinical provide? How would you rate your knowledge of non-clinical providers can do to improve oral health? Uh, I'm a little dyslexic, so you all read that and figure out what you think that means. One to four, please. And I think that was a typo in there. Okay, and let's hop on to that. There we go. 64% play fair, so you're definitely in the right place here. The last question at this point, how would you rate your knowledge of the support and resources NNOHA provides to safety net oral health programs? Again, one through four, four being four, one being excellent, and it's how would you rate your knowledge? Okay, 13 results, and let's go ahead and Close it out. We put in the pie chart this time because we're tired of seeing the vertical chart. <laughs> so anyway, 77% of you say poor, so you're definitely in the right place with that. I go to the person you actually want to talk to, who is here. to identify local oral health resources. Is that all of them? Do you know? Okay. Here we go. Ooh, for horizontal chart. Isn't that cool? That's pretty. Okay, <laughs> and 43% safe for. So you're in the right place, folks. Now you get to listen to the person you actually <laughs> want you want to listen to. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us uh, this afternoon. I know that this is the last session of the day, so I hope everybody's not too tired or you know having the food coma after lunch. Um, but again, thank you so much, and I also wanted to uh, thank Dan for joining me from all the way from Boise, Idaho. I was looking for a co-presenter, and you know he was 
the only nice person that said, I'll come with you. So um, really appreciate uh, Dan's support. You know, having the dental pro uh, provider's perspective really helps. Uh, so again, my name is Mitsuko Ikeda, and I'm the project director at the National Network for Oral Health Access, NOAA. And we are, um, as you can see on the um, panel, uh, in the screen, we are the nationwide network of uh, dental providers in the safety net systems and their supporters. Um, and you know, it started about 20 years ago as the support system for dental directors that were seeing the need to support each other. Uh, you know, when many health centers were losing their dental programs, and you know, as uh, as the you know organization evolved, it became larger and larger. And now we support the safety net dental providers, uh, you know, in general. So we have about 2,000 members in the organization. Um, our membership is very cheap, $50 for dentists, then, then and you know, we have other categories as well. And most of our resources are accessible for non-members as well. And we're known to be that, you know, the resource provider, the TA organization, uh, you know, really representing the voices of oral health providers serving the underserved, um, you know, at the national level. So I, I know that this is pretty much uh, what you already know. Actually, I wanted to find out uh, who you are. So how many of you actually work in the health centers? Oh, great. Uh, in the public housing related organizations? Okay. Um, anything else? I don't know where, what you are. Residents of public housing. Okay, okay. Um, does anybody have any specific reason why you wanted to participate in this presentation today? Yes? Mm, that's a really great point. Anybody else? Yes. Um, our current goal for this year is integrating dental into our primary care office. So that's exactly what. Oh, that's great. We're I'm really excited. We're trying to figure out how to do it. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That, that's, that's really helpful uh, along with the, the survey that we just did, you know, to know the audience and your needs. And, you know, um, as an organization, you know, we really see the need uh, for oral health. And I think, you know, even among the aging populations or uh, public housing authorities, you know, they probably, you know, see oral health as their greatest needs that's unmet. But many times, you know, you may not know, you know, what the resources are, you know, that's available for you. So this is just the basic statistics of the health centers. Um, and we don't know exactly how many health centers actually provide the dental care. There's no such data, unfortunately. But estimatedly, we have uh, about eight, 828 health centers offering dental care, uh, you know, directly on site. Um, but you also see that, you know, although, you know, we have improved in uh, providing more uh, dental care to more people in the past, you know, there is still a huge gap between uh, how many people are receiving uh, medical care from the health centers versus how many are receiving dental. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and this is the public housing data in specific, uh, you know, in terms of the age breakdown and uh, about 40,000 people receiving dental care. Uh, also, the language need, I think, you know, is definitely significant. So just as a background, and I'm sure most of you probably have seen this already from the UDS. Um, yesterday, we were talking about seniors' oral health, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well. Um, you know, again, uh, good news is many people are keeping their teeth. But, you know, when it comes to the income level, you know, you see sharp differences. So, you know, again, you know, people who are under poverty line have much greater needs, unproportionately greater needs than the people who are not. Uh, also, another thing that complicates, uh, you know, I think our population in general, you know, the people that you serve is that they have many, many health issues, not just one. So, you know, many of them are taking medications for chronic conditions that they are dealing with, and that affects oral health. You know, there are uh, symptoms and then also what options are available to them. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. And uh, I forgot to put it in here, but uh, we just did a webinar. And if you go to our web, uh, website, which is available on the slide later, um, we have a section for our webinars, and many of them are archived. And you can actually listen to the archives, and some of them you can even get C credits for the archived session. So the most recent one, actually one of the most recent ones that we did in March, was about oral health, systemic health, and pharmacology. So uh, we talked about you know, how those uh, different uh, things are interconnected, and also how the use of medications impact oral health of the underserved population. So definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, 
and in terms of the seniors' oral health, again, you know, there is definitely these great needs about dental caries, the periodontal disease. Uh, also, dental insurance is definitely a big aspect of it. I'm going to go into more details in the next slide, but you know, there is definitely a need uh, to think about. You know, what are the different ways to address you know this kind of needs? Because if they cannot pay for it, then they are not likely to seek for the care. Um, so, uh, in terms of access challenges for adults and elders, and I think you know even the public housing populations, uh, there are many. Uh, aspects that can be possibly barriers to care, including transportation, uh, mobility, language, um, you know, navigating the system so they can seek the care, and then of course the dental insurance. Um, so talking a little bit more specifically about the insurance challenges, you know, these are really your, um, if your health centers, um, you know, most prominent um, payer sources, Medicare and Medicaid. But if you look at it closely, you know, most of the routine dental care for adults are not covered. So it really poses such a challenge. You know, how can we make dental programs financially sustainable? Because you have to serve your population, you have to fulfill your mission, but you also have to make the bottom line so you're not you know, going into red. And that's, I think, uh, you know, one of the most uh, challenging issues that dental directors and dental providers uh, face when they're operating their dental program. So if you look at the charts uh, at the bottom, you know, a th about a third of the populations, you know, both in health centers in general and the public housing, uh, they are uninsured. And then, the, you know, of course, the biggest payer source is Medicaid. Um, but doesn't mean that, again, adult dental is covered. So it definitely uh, poses such a challenge. And, you know, Dan can also tell you about his program. You know, he has very unique challenge because of the specific state that he's in, too. Um, so, again, insurance challenges, I'm not going to read them all. Um, but you can just see, you know, there is so much needs uh, to address these issues at the policy level, but also, you know, us being really creative of, again, you know, if this is not the viable option right now, how can we make our dental programs financially successful? Uh, you know, for example, it says 70 percent of older adults did not have any dental coverage in 2004. You know, that's definitely a barrier, right? Um, so a little bit about other issues uh, in terms of maintaining oral health. So again, medication use. Uh, one of the, I think, most well-known symptoms when you take lots of medications uh, is the dry mouth. So that affects your oral health. Um, motor control issues, especially for seniors, you know, that could affect their dental hygiene, your ability to take care of your teeth. Uh, diet is definitely one issue, you know, uh, meaning that it can affect oral health, but also oral health can affect the diet. So yesterday I was sharing the example that um, I'm actually flying out to Japan next morning, tomorrow morning, 7.30, my flight. Uh, so I have to head out right after this presentation. But uh, one of the things I will do in Japan is actually meet my grandmother that just turned 89. And, you know, she lost so much weight. I don't know if you were there yesterday, but they talked about the longevity in different countries. And Japan's one of the countries that's known to live long, you know. But even then, you know, people have oral health challenges. And that can really impact your well-being, you know. So she, you know, I, I remember her being kind of a chubby person, you know, growing up, and now she became much smaller, smaller than me, you know, so that was definitely shocking when I saw her last time. So, you know, to me, it really hit home, you know, the issue of oral health and, you know, importance of that to your overall health, and that's the message that at NOAA we're trying to constantly emphasize. So enough of the problems, because I'm sure you've known those things already. Uh, so really the purpose of the presentation today for me is to you know, share some of the resources that we have at NOAA, some of the things that I know that other organizations offer. Again, those are not exhaustive. There is so much more, uh, so that you don't have to do all the research yourself. And then if you have any specific needs, you know, please contact me. You have our contact information in the slide. So we can uh, definitely talk to you one on one. Um, so, in terms of addressing these uh, challenges, you know, there are many different ways to address. Of course, I think the, you know, not the, I don't want to say the best, but, you know, one of the most, uh, I guess, the solution that we want to encourage is, of course, you know, for every health center to have, to have a dental program, but that can be a costly option. Uh, so, another thing that we talk about, and, you know, you mentioned this in the audience, is the medical and dental integration. How can we really expand the capacity of the primary care providers to look for oral health, 
you know, of the patients and how can we really support them to, need, you know, get the skills that they need. Um, you know, and there are also resources available at the local level. Uh, also, workforce innovation. How can we utilize every member of the dental team at their uh, maximum scope so we can care for more people? Um, so, if any of the health centers are interested in starting a dental program or even expanding yours, you know, to have new sites or, uh, you know, add more services, we have a couple of things uh, on our page. Uh, it's how to start a dental clinic and uh, you can look for toolkit and other resources that we have on there. Uh, another resource that we wanted to emphasize is the Safety Net Dental Clinic Manual. Uh, we don't own this, but we are one of the partners that regularly maintain uh, the content so that it's up to date. And it has variable resources of, you know, how to finance the safety net clinics, how to staff it, productivity, uh, risk management, all these factors that would impact the success of the dental clinic. And I believe that slides will be available on the website of the North American Management later, uh, so you don't have to write down everything, but just so you know uh, that we, you know, these are available. Uh, for NOAA resources, uh, you know, these are more general resources, and we'll be developing more specific uh, resources catered toward uh, health centers and uh, organizations serving the seniors and public housing residents in the future. But for now, I think those three things are really uh, helpful in general. So one of the things is the characteristics of a quality oral health uh, program. So we uh, convened a panel of experts like Dan, you know, who have great oral health programs or who have seen those things you know, around the country. And you know, we uh, thought about you know, what makes a health center program successful. You know, now every health center, of course, is different. But there are some, I guess, you know, characteristics that you can look for. Uh, when you are looking about, you know, thinking about how to make your health center or oral health program more successful. So uh, we have that available on our website. Uh, we also just recently uh, published the action guide for oral health in the patient-centered health home. So uh, we interviewed dental directors, actually nine of them, who, have, uh, who, who are leading health centers that are successful in integrating dental care to the, pati uh, to the patient in their health home or, I mean, integrating dental to medical in general. Uh, and we identified, I think, six or seven different uh, characteristics of, you know, what makes them successful. Uh, one that really stuck out to me is the leadership support. So leadership of the dental director, you know, the vision, you know, having the voice at the table and having enough support from the executive director. Because and as much as we hate to admit, it can sometimes be, a, sometimes be a top down approach, you know. So, if the executive director is not supportive, these things don't happen, you know. So, we have this action guide and, you know, what we found out uh, how health centers can implement this um, learning from the successful examples. We also have the operations manual for health center or health programs. Uh, this is, I think, one of the most well known resources of NOAA. We have six chapters available. I think uh, I left some of the copies of the first chapter in the back, so some people have it uh, in the audience. But we have fundamentals, leadership, financials, risk management, workforce, and quality. And they are really considered, you know, from HRSA and uh, other oral health uh, organizations and health center organizations that, you know, as the standards of oral health care. Um, in the health center world, and you know, Dan was one of the contributors. It's really, you know, documenting those successful standards and guidelines that works in health centers, ensuring uh, widely so others can really learn from that, so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, other resources, again, I think health centers really are the most prominent resources, but you know, there are other resources available too. Uh, you know, one example you heard. Jim Hunt today, you know, in the morning, uh, you know, from Massachusetts, but Boston is, uh, you know, doing a great job, you know, in terms of the state program. So they have a senior oral health project at the state level, uh, at the city level. Uh, it's a joint project between the Public Housing Commission, Public Health Department, uh, a foundation from the local, uh, you know, local foundation and the health center, family health center, and they provide uh, oral health care for the seniors living in residence, uh, uh, public house, public housing. So, you know, maybe those are the models that you can look for and, you know, think about how you might be able to implement that at the state level when you go back. Um, 
there are of course one time events like mission of mercy where you know they set up a camp and you know provide dental care just for short term you know again not a sustainable solution but one way that people can get the care and uh, over 20 states uh, have those programs so you know your states might be one of them many people do go you know out of state too to seek care so definitely a huge need for oral health care um, ADA also has great resources. So uh, the first one is free, and that's always good. So uh, the oral longevity DVD uh, is the educational tool, uh, you know, teaching patients about how to care for their teeth and you know different uh, to topics in oral health. And those are really short videos, but really useful, and you can download them or order copies. Um, they also did a conference on uh, older adults and dis uh, persons with disabilities. Uh, they haven't done anything recently, but the proceedings and materials from 2010 are available. Um, they also have a you know, DVD called Overcoming Obstacles to Oral Health. Uh, these are training tools for caregivers who care for older adults and uh, people with disability, and you can find it in the ADA catalog. Um, these are other resources. Uh, one I want to highlight is the Smiles for Life. So when you know you are thinking about educating medical providers, you know non-dental providers in oral health uh, competencies, I think these are really great resources. They have I think seven or eight different chapters or different modules. Uh, they have a chapter on geriatric oral health, for example. So and you can get C for free as well. So it's really a great incentive for medical uh, providers to get educated about oral health and how they can you know, improve their competency. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about workforce innovation. So you know, again, it's state specific, so I can't talk about every single state here. But you know, uh, each state has uh, practice acts and what dental hygienists can do independently. Uh, in some states, they have uh, dental hygienist in alternative practice, you know, for example, in California, where, you know, they can uh, care for special needs populations in, you know, nursing homes or in other uh, alternative practices so they can provide the dental care on site. And, you know, some health centers do contract with these providers so they can really expand their services. Uh, so with that, I would conclude my presentation and turn it over to Dan. I started out my career um, in college at Ohio State in microbiology. And I got to dental school. Dean called me and he said, you know, with your background, you don't have to take our course in oral microbiology. And I said, um, I don't know anything about the mouth. And he said, it doesn't make any difference. And you know what? It struck a chord with me. I said, that's about the most senseless thing I ever heard. So that planted the seed in my mind that has became my passion and it's been my passion ever since. Um, I got into the Navy, went to Vietnam, came back, started to practice about 15 miles down the road in Reston, Virginia. And I ran across a researcher by the name of Paul Kies at NIH <clears throat> and he was doing some interesting work that he was taking samples from the mouth and he was qualifying the bacteria, picking out bacterial targets, eliminating them, and he was eliminating the disease. <laughs> I thought, wow, this is perfect. So I took his, what he was doing, and I took it back to my practice, and sure enough, it was amazing how we could turn around oral diseases. Well, as you might well imagine, we weren't well liked in the dental community, and uh, they made what we were doing controversial press picked up on baking soda and peroxide, which I'm sure you've heard about. But the, uh, the, the bottom line was what we were doing was we were, we were utilizing any infective therapy and eliminating oral pathogens. And it's amazing when you do that, what you can do for a person. You don't have to have these bad bacteria. You don't. Where did you get them? Well, we'll talk about that. And I'm going to go, who cares? Well, who does care? You know, it's amazing to me how oral dis diseases are kind of cast aside and everything. Yeah, well, yeah. All the way down to the patients. Yeah, well, it's kind of like a hopeless situation. I know if, you know, I'm going to get cavities. I know I'm going to lose my teeth. And it's just one of those things. Who cares about oral diseases? 
and it's just not a high priority. But yet, oral pathogens are found in, in defective cardiac lesions. They're found in aortic aneurysms. They're found in carotid artery plaque. They raise the reactive protein in TNC, which obviously adversely affects diabetes. Now, at this point, we don't know ex for sure what they're doing there, but we know they're not doing any good if they can tear the, the dickens out of a tooth. They're certainly not doing the rest of the body any good, right? So we know that they're there. There is some theories, and one of the theories is that if you think about the anatomy of the body, like the coronary artery, for example, and the blood comes out of the, the, the valve, and in about one inch has to make a U-turn. And if you know anything about rivers, you know that any time you have a river that does that, you're going to get rapids, and you're going to get turbulence, and you're going to get eddies. So one of the theories is that where we create eddies in the body, we allow bacteria such as oral pathogens to latch onto the endothelium and initiate the lesion. It's a theory, okay? But it's, to me, it's fairly logical. <clears throat> so we look at how it affects diabetes. Well, every time you chew, you have the potential of driving the bacteria in your bloodstream. And it always has amazed me how, you know, you, you have a heart mover. Oh, if you go to the dentist, make sure you get an antibiotic. That's pretty wild, isn't it, when you think about it? If you have a heart murmur, you're supposed to get an antibiotic. Well, what happens if you don't have a heart murmur? You've got to get the bacteremia, right? What's it doing to you? Nobody ever thought about that sort of stuff, or, or at least they're not really looking at it very closely. But we do know that the bacteremia will uh, actually adversely affect the blood sugar levels, which in turn affects the glycolic uh, uh, receptors in the gingival tissue. So you've got a cyclical thing going on here where you raise the blood sugar, then it really affects the body's ability to fight these bacteria. So you're going to get periodontal disease a lot more quickly and a lot more severely if you're diabetic. Okay, the symbiotic relationship can lead to a downward spiral. No doubt about it. Now you look at this person, <clears throat> and they were well controlled, and then they started all of a sudden getting out of control. And they took a look at the mouth, and look at the bacteria growing in here. I mean, you can see it. That's bacteria. That isn't plaque. Those are actually biofilms full of bacteria to the point where you can scrape it off like scum. This is like a living Petri dish right here. And what happened to this person? Well, for whatever reason, and we don't know, one of the things that happens when you get medication and your salivary flow uh, decreases, that takes away one of the primary uh, antibacterial uh, intrinsic values that we have in our system. And uh, that's possibly what happened. And she continues to eat sugar at the same rate she did, but now she can't fight it off as well. So this is what happens to her. This is a study that, that I found very interesting that came out in the Journal, journal of Neuroinflammation. And this came out just last October. And what it was, Judith McClossey uh, was doing a DNA analysis of the myeloid tissue in the cadavers of patients dying that died from Alzheimer's. And she found that 90% of them had the spirochetes associated with periodontal disease. 90%. Do we know what they're doing? No. Do they know if we cause something? No, we don't. But just the very fact that they're there has to create an alarm. Okay, we talked about pneumonia. A biofilm associated with periodontal disease is a reservoir for all kinds of bacteria. When you looked at that bacterial mat that I showed you a little while ago, you know, any opportunistic bacteria that happens to come into that mouth can find a wonderful place to live. You talk about Diplococcus pneumoniae, Helicobacter pylori, Cytomegalovirus, human papilloma viruses. These have all been found in this. It's a great place for bacteria to live. So this has got to be the portal of entry for a lot of pathogens that come into our body. 
So given the exposure to other possible infective organisms, it's possible uh, that this portal of entry can be related to many other diseases, right? So anyway, just to get back to all that, and we start looking at, this is a seven-year-old, and happens to be a pretty good, healthy seven-year-old. There's not a lot of biofilm on the teeth. And uh, let me just say, teeth are teeth. Uh, there's not nothing, uh, there's no soft teeth. And unless you have some of the rare forms of enamel hypoplasia or something like that, the teeth are pretty much the same throughout. What is the difference? Well, intrinsically, your salivary flow is one of the main ones, and saliva does have certain, certain qualitative uh, abilities. Some people are a little bit better uh, with their antibacterial uh, potential in their saliva than others. But the fact is, you look at this, and what's going to affect this seven-year-old throughout their life? Fortunately, it wasn't a baby bottle that got them, but are they already infected with any bacteria? You know, we're not born with any. So where do we get it? And we know that the mother is the first source of the bacteria. So if a mother has a lot of disease-associated bacteria, she's going to impart them to the child. So that's the first load that we get. Fortunately for this child, it's not too bad. I don't know about their dietary habits, but we, all, we know that it's pretty healthy at this point in time. But what passes through those lips from now on, and becomes and as soon as it passes through the lips, it's, in, it's internalized. And we internalize an awful lot of things through our mouth. That's for sure. That's where it comes from. If you think about it, when you kiss somebody and you get their saliva, you're not only kissing that person, but you're kissing every person that person ever kissed from a bacteriological standpoint. So think about that. Think about those days in college. <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> okay. Well, there's been a lot of initiatives, and we talked about one for the elderly uh, yesterday, uh, what the ADA did, so forth, and, and uh, GlaxoSmithKline pumped a million dollars into this program, and they printed a bunch of brochures. And what did the brochure say? Brush and floss and see your dentist every six months what the, the ADA has been saying for the last 100 years. Brush and floss. Whether you have disease or not, the, the message is the same, right? And when you get to the dentist, what's going to happen? Ah, I'm finding a bunch of stuff in here. You're not flossing every day, are you? Can you imagine attacking any other disease in the body with this kind of mentality? And we look at the cost that we've, we're throwing at this. Oral health, or oral disease, is actually tied with heart conditions as the second most expensive disease, chronic disease, after cancer. Wow, we're throwing a lot of money at this disease. And when you think about this cost, what keeps people away? Person thinks, number one, I'm going to be sitting in this chair, and I'm going to have somebody one foot from my face, which is intimidating. Number two, they're probably going to hurt me. And number three, it's going to cost me a fortune, right? We wonder why people don't go to the dentist. And that's the reason. So we have to take a fundamentally new approach of looking at the problem. And as Bernie uh, Sanders said, uh, just here in February, we've got a crisis, no doubt about it. I mean, look at uh, 830,000 visits to the ER for dental reasons. 60% of the kids have caries. The dentists per capita are declining, especially in those treating low-income populations. 47 million have difficulty accessing dental care. So. Even if you get through that mental barrier of saying, I'm going to be intimidated, I'm going to be hurt, and it's going to cost me a lot, you still have an access issue. Amazing, isn't it? So we have a problem. We definitely have a crisis. 
One of the most prescient words that I ever heard spoken was David Satcher back in 2000. And look what he said. We must build an effective infrastructure that meets the oral health needs. Wow, think about that. I, as a dentist, when I first read that, said, ooh, I thought we already had one. Right? I mean, shoot, we got a lot of dentists. We got a lot of hygienists. What's he talking about? Building an effective infrastructure. He's saying the one we have isn't, doesn't do it. He also says it's got to integrate oral health effectively into overall health. And we must change the perceptions about oral health among the general public. And we got to remove the barriers. He hit it on the head. That was prescient. That was 2000. What's happened? Well, we look at 2005. We find the same old story here in Boston in, in the elder care. Look at this, 63% of them had dentures. That means that we had that many, 63%, that we had total fa failures, and now they're, they're in dentures. And 59% of those didn't even fit. <laughs> and out of the ones that are left now, the 63% didn't have teeth, 28% had untreated caries, 28% had soft tissue problems. Those are unbelievable figures. When we think about a disease in the mouth that's affecting the body as much as it is, why are we in this situation? This is what they said, the point, their plan of action, change perceptions. It's a little bit uh, what David Satcher said. Build the science base, accelerate science transfer, increase the workforce diversity. So what are they talking about there? Non-dentist personnel that are taking care of this. So, even after this in 2005, what, where are we now? And how much better? It's just there. The Institute of Medicine came out with a report uh, last year, and they're talking about that we got to change the way we look at oral diseases. We have to have overlapping scopes of practice. What they're talking about is getting the medical profession involved into oral diseases. We got to broaden the workforce. And, and, and expand the roles, and amend the listing laws to make that happen. And we've got to permit the kinds of technology-supported supervision that facil facilitates care and expand access. And that's my passion, because it's a bacterial infection, folks. Why aren't we looking at the bacteria? Okay. I can tell you from experience that there are barriers. And if you look at uh, organized dentistry, they're not going to look at this in a favorable light. When a dentist comes out of school, he owes about $230,000. And what's he going to think about, or she? i got to pay my bills. So how do I do that? I need to learn how to do implants. I need to learn how to do, do crowns and bridges and things that, that are going to pay help me pay that back. You know, disease management's not very uh, cost productive. I mean, it just you're just not going to get paid much for that. Now, 90% of the physicians realize that this is an issue, but uh, the, the, at least half of them have, have not had any training in it. So, that's the dilemma that we're facing. We see what the ADA threw up in, uh, um, <laughs> excuse that word, threw up, uh, in 2010, but, you know, this just irks me. Uh, it, this is silo building. You know, where they're saying, okay, primary dental care has to be a dentist, a primary dental care provider has to be a dentist, and a dental home is a dentist. So these roadblocks are there. How do we work our way through these roadblocks and come up with some meaningful, meaningful ways to attack the problem? There's only 1.4% of the dentists are, are uh, in public health, yet 80% of the disease is concentrated in the underserved populations. Isn't that wild? I can tell you from experience. You know, when I was in private practice down the road here, um, I got my, my patients really healthy. I had five hygienists. And for the most part, we were just maining, maintaining teeth. Uh, you know, they come in, get a cleaning, we check them out. Yeah, you're doing fine, so forth. We got them that healthy. And I would take my 15 or so uh, charity cases, you know, I think, well, I'm really kind of smug. I'm really helping out society and everything. Everything's really good. And then I entered the public health side. 
and my mouth continues to drop all the time. I take out more teeth in one day than I did in a year, my private practice. And what I see disease-wise is just appalling. And I see an awful lot of absolutely wonderful people that don't know how they got there. So we as a society, we as a group are not doing our job. I don't blame it on the patient. I blame it on my profession and us as a whole. Now, some of the things we've been doing to try to, to help this uh, is we talk about health homes, and this was a, a white paper that, uh, that I was on the committee to, to help produce. Um, it was kind of fun. And the National Oral Health Policy Center has come out when talking about health homes. So instead of a medical home or a dental home, we should be talking about health homes. And that's where we coordinate medical, behavioral health, dental services by full integration, co-location, shared financing, virtual linkages, and facilitated referral and follow-up. And if this is not happening in your health center, this is the trend and this is where we're headed. And this is what we need to be doing together and working on. And I, I, I implore all of you to think about that and move oral health up in your priority list. Yeah, we've got a bunch of them. And, and every medical provider I talk to, you know, my plate's full. It is. And I, I'm trying to add another one to that plate, but we have to. I really totally believe that the only way that we're going to solve this issue is when oral health becomes a part of the primary care. When I say here, how can, how can we ignore it if it's, if it's affecting the systemic conditions? Okay, it's preventable. We have good evidence that primary care interventions can make a difference. Jeez, with just fluoride varnishes alone, it's made a difference. Dentists are, are shrinking, so we have to figure out a way to do it. We cannot drill and fill our way out of this. You know, I, I think of myself as a repair odontist. You know, we repair damage. How many dentists... I, how many, is there any dentists here? Oh. Ask them to name three oral pathogens. <clears throat> okay, just, just do that and see what they say. Because we're just not glued into that direction. We're glued into the repair side. Ask them if they, ask them if they know what uh, actinomyces viscosis metabolizes. Okay. You know, I'm old and I can say what I want. <laughs> and uh, and I'm, I'm just speaking my mind here because it's, it's been so frustrating to me because I have given over 500 seminars on this topic over the last 30 years. And, you know, I've got patients, but they're wearing thin. It's about time we did something. Okay. The answer... The I see is we have to work through our, our FQACs. That is where we're going to develop health homes together. And the three aims, obviously, is to improve the quality. Yep, you got it. And we need to do a good job of managing disease risk. And we can do that in oral diseases. We've got to empower individuals to take the ownership of their health educate, inform, and disseminate the information. Do you know that what a patient does at home is over a hundred times more powerful than what I can do as a dentist, seeing the dentist, seeing the patient every three months? It's where it is. What a patient does for themselves is the answer for oral disease. We've got to create the health system that will focus on this and support the patient fully in this and help them recognize, help, help them recognize what this issue is all about. We're lucky in FQHCs. And how many of, a, of you have dental components that are directly, uh, physically located in the same location? Wow, I love it. Yeah. You've got to leg up because you can talk easily. And you can make these things happen easier. In, in my uh, world, 
I know Idaho is kind of an amazing state. We've got 1,400,000 people. There are more people in Fairfax County where we're sitting right now than there is the entire state of Idaho. So we have a, uh, you, you can look at it in two ways. It's kind of nice to have all that elbow room. But uh, when you're talking about reaching people, I mean, you've got to travel a little bit. So I have five clinics, and they're spread out over a fairly wide area. So my, my deal is we're spread out. We're not even located near the medical facility. So uh, trying, to, trying to get those, that coordination is a little bit harder. And I would say that every new facility that is being built in the future, that any of you that's going after new access points, that you have both behavioral health and dental within the medical, right in that facility. This is one of my clinics. And uh, you can see we do, even though we're out in Idaho, we do have fairly nice equipment. Uh, and I just wanted to show you my hygiene room. And you see the, uh, the wall-mounted uh, video. And you see the microscope. We take specimens, subgenital specimens, and we show the patient the bacteria. And if you've ever seen the bacteria of periodontal disease, it will scare you. Because you see spirochetes, and you see these little snakes running around. And you know, it's amazing. I, I can't tell you, well, I, I can't. I don't know what I can tell you in public, some of the things I've seen in the mouth. But um, <laughs> it's amazing what you pick up. And the, 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 the real issue here is that when you do this, and you show the patient these bacteria. I mean, I, I pick up trichomonads a lot, uh, for example, and, and um, yeah, amoeba, and a lot of those types of organizations, or, or, organisms. And also, you, uh, you see a lot of, of white blood cells. So immediately you know you've got an inflammatory process going on, and you can see some of the players. Now, can I see them all? No. There's a lot of non-modal bacteria uh, that, uh, that come into play, and you're not going to be able to really identify those. But if you think of it as a biofilm, and think of it as uh, almost like a coral reef, where if you pull out a few of the live things in there, you can actually destroy the reef. It's the same thing as your lawn. If you want to grow a good lawn, you know how to take care of the weeds. And you know that once you get that grass growing really well, it's going to help you keep the weeds out, right? Same thing is true in the mouth. If we promote the good bacteria and target the bad bacteria and eliminate them, you can eliminate oral diseases. This is uh, the room where I try to do all my uh, new patient exams and, and uh, take a sample. and and let them know. You know, the thing is that's worth a million words and people immediately say, well, that's in my mouth. Are you kidding me? Say, yeah, and this is really affecting your body. Whoa, now you've got somebody's motivated to want to start to do something about it. We also take a strep butans test, which gives us the carogenic potential that the patient has. And this is what I see as the future. You know, that's where we need to be going. You want to know what to do, just one little simple thing for a patient, is an irrigator. Because you can put whatever you want to put in this irrigator. Water, chlorhexidine, and actually 0.2% chlorhexidine is the optimum therapeutic dose that will actually eliminate these bacteria. It doesn't taste good, and um, uh, it's not particularly cheap. So it's one of those things that a lot of patients won't go for. I, one of the things I do with my population, and 80% of my patients are self-pay patients. Only 13 are, are Medicaid patients in my practice. And so I have a lot of people that are on extremely limited income. And so I say, hey, look, if you can manage to get the irrigator, buy a quart bottle of Clorox, and put a half a cap full of, of Clorox in that irrigator and fill it full of water and irrigate with it, and then brush with baking soda right afterwards. Cheap and effective, OK? The real issue is uh, the little tip that goes up there. This is like a power washer. You can clean your deck with a power washer a lot easier. You can get in those slats right on that, between the, uh, the, the, the boards with a power washer better than you can with a brush. Same thing is true here. 
You can stick this uh, this irrigator right up beneath the gums and let that just work that right uh, right into the tissue. Now I know you're not a dentist, and uh, you look at this X-ray, it may not mean much to you, but if you can get an idea of where the level of bone is in there, that's pretty sad, isn't it? And you can actually see some of the calculus growing on the teeth and so forth. But you can see the bone level, especially on that one molar right there in the center, uh, is, is infected all the way down to the root tips, right? This is a year later. Now, this is a patient in my own practice, my private practice, that came to me from Calgary, Canada, and wanted to save her teeth. So I had a motivated patient to start with. But I wanted to show you what you can do when you've got a motivated patient and you want to, want to turn them around, and they want to turn around. Yeah, I had to do root canals, had to do some crowns and so forth. But the main thing is look at the bone level. Can you regrow bone? Well, I heard a lot of dentists tell me, you know, when I was lecturing around the country, they said, you reverse those slides. I said, no, 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 that's, that's real. And that's the kind of growth that we got. When you eliminate the infection. Now, when you have somebody with periodontal disease and it's, uh, you know, it's pretty severe, you need the antibiotics along with it. And I find that metronidazole in combination with amoxicillin, and I, I generally did it, you know, a lot of studies show uh, uh, com uh, the compliance of, of, uh, of any medication, and twice a day is when you're gonna get the highest rate of compliance. And so uh, I told him to take one in the morning before breakfast and one in uh, the night before dinner uh, of each. 500 milligrams of each for 14 days. And you do that in combination with irrigations and, uh, and brushing with baking soda, and you can make a difference right there. Now, I stole these out of the archives of, of NIH. And if you had never seen live bacteria, um, you can see they're kind of ugly. And you know, some of these guys are not bad guys. And some of them are not good guys. Uh, the one with the long nose up there, you know, uh, uh, I've never been able to determine whether that was a good one or a bad one. But in any case, the bacteria come in a lot of different shapes and forms and uh, pathogenicity. But the bottom line is when, you, when they're able to produce cities, which the biofilms that I showed you earlier, whenever you see that, and they're producing acids, and they're producing something that is very toxic to the system. Now, so which of the, if you were going to target these bacteria, which one would you go for? How about the, the one that's building the outhouse? All right? He's the builder. He's the one that's going to create the city, right? The one down here on the bottom, you know, with the bottle in his hand, that's one we don't have to worry about. The one asleep there is not one we have to worry about. But the ones that are the builders of the biofilm are the ones that we, we target. So, why a primary team? Oral diseases are multifactorial. We've got a communicable, uh, actually it's transmissible bacterial infection. We catch it. It's a nutritional element, obviously. Sugar feeds the uh, certain bacteria. And actually, I, you know, I asked you about actinomyces viscosis. Uh, that will actually metabolize both sugars and starches. So when you see an older person with root caries, then actinomyces viscosis is probably one of the leading bacteria causing the problem. It's pharmacological and sociological. So those are the issues. That's an awful lot for a dentist that repairs teeth. And it needs to be in a complex team of, in the primary care system. You take this person right here who uh, ended up with some, uh, some systemic problems, depression, cardiovascular disease, and they put her on medication, and she came back like this. Now, two elements here. She became depressed. And two, her salivary flow really diminished. 
So even if our eating habits didn't change, what happened was she stopped brushing as well and, and her salivary flow didn't protect her as well. So she ended up like this. Okay? So that's why this is multifactorial. We have to look at all these issues that come into play here. Okay, those are all the things that happen with the nutritional side. And CHCs are definitely leading the way. We're doing a heck of a lot in trying to do the health home and, and get that to work. And this is where the ball game is. Uh, when we come to oral health, it's, it's in the bacteria. As uh, what was it Clinton, uh, Clinton said, it's the bacteria, stupid. <laughs> Remember what he said, it's the economy. Okay, and I do see a day. And we have a primary care team. And it's a team. It's not just one physician. It's not just one nurse. It's a team. And in that team, I've got to start looking at the behavioral health issues the oral health issues, and the systemic issues. And can you see how we're doing with our computers? It isn't very far off where a person can come in, and a com computer can probably do most of this. And then um, we collect that data, and then we sit down with the patient and say, okay, on, on, a, on, a, on a one to 10 basis, your oral risk is this. We need to drop that down to this. Your behavioral uh, issues, you're a little bit depressed, and we need to get that down to this. So we can actually measure these things with our patients, and then we can turn that around. And I see another thing for community health centers, and that is that we can actually look at our sliding fees and say, we're going to give you six months to get this down to this, or we're going to have to raise it up to another level of cost. So that's another way that the, the illness on the patient can happen. But first, we have to develop the right metrics for all that. Are they there yet? No, and I wish I could tell you they were. But if you and I work together, we can make that happen. It isn't rocket science here in terms of identifying the bacteria. It isn't. And uh, a phase contrast microscope and a strep mutans test are two things you can put in immediately that work. I hope I live to see that day. In uh, Idaho, we are doing, uh, uh, we've got a complete oral health initiative program that we're doing. And uh, we're tied up with the National Oral Health Alliance. Uh, this is not NOAA over here. This is the National Oral Health Alliance, which is a, a, a new initiative that, uh, that has come about. And I'm just so glad to see this. And right now there's 26 uh, different uh, organizations that received a $100,000 grant to integrate oral health into the medical programs. And we got one of those grants and uh, we're making every effort to make this happen. We have four community health centers that uh, we have a meeting next week where we're getting together and saying, okay, how do we do this? And my thing, as I say, hire a hygienist and put them in the primary care clinic as the patient oral health coordinator. Okay, we're doing uh, uh, this uh, collaboration and we're vying for the next two years, we get another $300,000 for this project if, if, uh, if all goes well. We have to uh, write for that this summer. And how did we do it? A few committed souls, we seized the opportunity, recognized the need, followed our beliefs, recognized the power of a network, shared the vision. And that's when Denicrest Foundation agreed and gave us the $100,000 grant. Now these are the number of states or where they're located where they, they, that, that have these grants. And they're competitive and we're hoping that, to get the next phase coming this summer. So we've got an action plan, and believe me, you have to work with your state on this and work through your, your, your state oral health coordinators. And um, 
our primary care association is also very deeply involved in this. And these are the four health centers in Idaho that are doing this. So remember, we continue to face opportunities disguised as unsolvable problems. Thanks. That's why we can't solve, we cannot solve this problem. You know, there's a, there's a group of people that, that are going to suffer before we get through this process. But we have to start somewhere. You know, I'll continue to take out the teeth, although it kills me every time I take one out. But the issue is, where do we start? We've got to start with the other side of it and get to the prevention and disease, exactly. disease management. The other question I have, when you show somebody a, a picture of their horrible mouth, do you show them also what it should nor it should look like because we have to have bacteria there, as you say. So not to scare them. I mean, they might actually become so obsessed they're going to kill everything off. <laughs> I'm just thinking. <laughs> Do you now, actually, actually, if you, if they don't have the disease, what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of non-modal bacteria. You'll see some little tiny so modal bacteria, so but you won't see the larger that. spirochetes and all that and that sort of thing. Okay. You know. Uh, but most people, I mean, you, the, the tactic here is to help them, not scare them. Right. And so, you know, obviously it's a very diplomatic sort of thing. And I can tell you that everybody goes through the same thing. Oh, my God, is that in my mouth? Mm. And, and they say, why didn't anybody ever tell, tell me about this before? And then the third is, what can I do about it? That's classic. Right. Okay? Okay. And that's... And, and that's what you hear. And the, and the beauty is, unless you get through those things, you don't go to how, what to do about it until you get there. They have to really buy into it first, and once they do, then they want to know. And they'll tell you. Yeah. Well, actually, I have a question, but I just want to pull up. So how do you balance your budget? <laughs> 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 oh, it's creative. <laughs> it's very creative. You know, because... <laughs> I'll tell you how we've done it, and we've actually created this, an environment where we've got a lot of people that come in with money, that come in because they know that we have a high-quality program that's as good as they're going to find anywhere, and they want to come in and they know that they're going to help somebody else by doing that. And, uh, yeah, and that's, and that's the number one, I said to my crew when I first started, we are the best there is, okay? And if you don't believe it, then you better believe it. And if you don't believe it, why? And let's correct it. Because we will be the best. And that's the first place you start. Question back here. Uh, can, you, can you say that regimen again with the irrigator? Do you fill it up with water and then add one cap of Clorox? Yes. It, half a teaspoon. Okay, get it right. <laughs> you <don't, laughs> yeah, you don't want any more than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, half a teaspoon of Clorox and, and a full tank of warm water. Yeah. And then baby cures next. Okay. Um, is there any advocating um, on part of the dentist to get affordable dental insurance? I never see any advertising for dental insurance. You will never see any. You know that all dental insurance is, is backwards because if you look at it, the person who's insured is the insurance company. As the cost goes up, the, 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 the percentage goes down on, on coverage. So dental insurance is not good. I mean, it really isn't. So how do, how do we get care for those who can't afford it or don't have a, even with those that have health care, health insurance, dental is not mentioned. And some people assume if they have health insurance, they have dental insurance. Yeah. And then they find out later 
that they don't have dental insurance. Yeah, that's one of the great barriers. Yes. It's, and it's what keeps them away. Yeah. Uh, comment and a question. Uh, I serve as a population that most of them have uh, Medicaid or Medicare uh, or mm -hmm. don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. And uh, every program uh, that we implement, we start with the health component first. We talk about health and how to be a principal. Uh, you stand up, tell everybody. Stand up, stand up until everybody can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, Hi, my name is Lakeisha Carr. Uh, I work for North Korea Development and Housing Authority, and we have several programs that uh, we implement at the authority. Each one of them starts with the health component, uh, where we uh, teach the residents on how to better take care of themselves uh, mentally, physically, and all of that. One piece that's missing is the dental. We are having uh, challenges in finding um, dentists or uh, agencies that are willing to help us with that. So you gave me some great ideas on preventative maintenance that we can teach our residents. So you mentioned about the bacon service. Um, I see uh, residents every day that I'm trying to help get employed and they have what you call the biofilm mm -hmm. uh, with the bacon soda help that. Yeah, it'll help us dramatically. Okay. okay. Dramatically. I mean, that's the simplest thing I can tell you to do. There are a lot of other things that will kill bacteria. But if we just start with the simple things here and make those things work and start making progress, you know, this is, this is we have to be patient. Right. Believe me, it isn't going to happen overnight. But if we, if we start and get it working through the medical system, that's where I see it. Another quick question in reference mm -hmm. to mouthwash. I, I've heard that some mouthwash will wipe out all of the bacteria, causing bad bacteria to grow rapidly. Is, is that true, or do you have the, a the worst one for that is peroxide? Um, that and and uh, you'll actually get uh, get it killed down to the point that you'll probably get thrush or something like that because of it. Okay. Thank you. Mhm. Mm yeah, I just wanted to bring back the disconnect with the insurances. The medical dental, the dental insurance, not being a dent, there's not being dental insurance. It, it sends a message to people that dental is not important, whereas medical is. So no. I think we need to get it together. That, that's and, why I'm trying to get right. it in the medical community. And that's the that's thing it. thing is, is that we have to also address the cultural uh, beliefs that some of our patients bring. I see, you know, young persons come in and says, I don't want to get the tooth pulled out. Are you, are you kidding me? You can't get that. That's your tooth forever. And, and changing that mindset also in our patients is very important. Because they think, okay, just pull one out. Yeah. Pull it out. Well, you won't get the ADA, you won't get, you, you, and you're not going to get dentists to want to buy into all this, and the only hope, really, is in primary care. I have a question. Is it more expensive to pull a tooth out or save it? Because we had a dentist in our neighborhood like 20 years ago, and it seemed like everybody was going to this dentist, but he wasn't fixing anything, including me, he was pulling my teeth out. And then I found out later that, well, it's long gone because I guess they found out what he was doing. I, oh. I wish I could help you with that problem, and I know our time is up. But yeah. uh, but I just I know all those problems, and I wish we could solve them all in an hour. It's pretty tough. But so it's you know. cheaper to pull it out there than to the canal and all. Sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So obviously, yeah. we have to prevent. And you yep. got to change the attitude for people yeah. with this. This is crazy because then they don't get employed because they only got caught. Yep. Okay. <laughs> We're just about out of time. Um, I hope you join me in thanking our wonderful panelists.